I got to read this now. Ahem. Access to this webinar is for educational and informational purposes only. Consult a licensed broker, registered investment advisor before placing any trades. All securities and orders discussed are tracked and monitored in virtual trading accounts, virtual account prices, and returns may differ from actual trading results. Commission costs are excluded. Neither PhilStockWorld.com, PSW, nor its affiliates, nor any of their respective officers, personnel, representatives, agents, or independent contractors are in such capacities licensed financial advisors, registered investment advisors, or registered broker dealers. Nothing contained in this webinar website or promotional material constitutes promotion, recommendation, solicitation, or offer of any particular investment, security, or transaction. Trading options involve risk. Visit the OCC website www.optionsclearing.com to read characteristics and risks of standardized options. PSW provides education and trading services that are meant to teach the risks and potential rewards of trading options, and we are not a service that tells you what to trade. We are not applying or guaranteeing any profit. As always, do not trade with money that you cannot afford to lose. Past performance does not equal future results, and results discussed in this webinar are not typical and are only valid on that specific or identified date. Your results may vary. By accessing this webinar, you agree to hold the above harmless, but any losses you may incur as a result of the information discussed in the video identified above. By accessing this webinar, you agree to be placed on our mailing list and receive our newsletter. Rest assured we take your privacy very seriously, and we will not distribute or sell your information to anyone. All right. This is fantastic. All right. So, what's going on today, guys? Uh, whoa. What's that? Oh, that's a dollar. Look at the dollar fly. That's not good. That, that's now. Okay, this is an interesting opportunity. The dollar really, really punched up, and it, it punched up since the oil report. Um, that's that's a big move for the dollar. So that's been really keeping all that. We, we like the longs on oil at 52, which it's under 52, and we like 172 on gasoline. It's way down at 171. So when it crosses 171 now, we're going to like it. Um, it. It never got a good cross up here, and we had a tight stop up here. Uh, I would obviously at 170, I prefer to go, but I think if it goes back over 171, you can go long. Because the dollar is so strong, it's pushing oil and gasoline down. In addition to obviously not, not the greatest report, but it was still better than the API indicated. In fact, let's take a, a closer look at that report. Um, we can be June 7th, right? That would be current. And let's take a look at what it actually says. Control plus plus. So remember, control minus minus all my screen get messed up. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay. All right. So we know about this. So basically, there was a, a net small draw. Uh, wait, a net small build. Nothing terrible. And that, but see these numbers are wacky. Because all other oils had a huge build. And I think maybe they're reacting to that because all other oils had a huge build of 10 million barrels. And we know the math is all whacked up on these numbers anyway. Um, somebody told me, uh, Z-Man, who's actually a smart oil guy, he says that this little note right here, that little one, it, it goes for not just the last thing. And I believe him because every week it still has the same note, even though the week is different. And it says C table one. And no, no, I'm sorry. No, that doesn't count. Don't say C table one. This note is this thing that says distillate fuel stocks located in the Northeast heating oil reserve are not included. So that may be why we're getting such a discrepancy when we add these up. Because watch, watch what happens when we add these things up. But if that were true, none of them should make sense, right? So that's what's weird also. Um, 483.3 plus 234.1 plus 129.4 plus 438.6 plus 6, whoop, 644.8. See, it's 1930.20. So, Z's theory is that 22 million barrels are stored in the Northeast Heating Reserve, but it says they're not included. But, you know, it, it's in other words, it, it, you know, I, I, I'm not sure he's right because to me, not included would mean that this number should be lower. 
I'm like, see, it depends on what they mean by not included. I think he takes not included to mean it's not included in this list, and therefore the total includes something that's not specifically listed out. I believe that's his interpretation of what that means. So in other words, there, there, there should be a line here for no reason, because it says distal of fuel or here, and you see how that has a three, but there's no three, and it's, it's wacky. Um, but in some way, he's, he's basically saying that this is somehow throwing it off, that the, the Northeast Heating Oil Reserve is not listed as an all other oil. It's not listed as a distillate. It's just not, it, it should be included here. And therefore, these numbers look higher because of that missing amount. That's what he, his interpretation is. I, I don't have a reason to think he's wrong. Z-Man, he knows his oils. So I think he knows what he's talking about. But we were baffled by why this is. A, now, the funny thing is, though, it never used to be like this. So it's kind of weird that suddenly they're doing this that way. Why don't they just add the line? They got room. Even for the table sake, even for the sake of being neat on the page, all it would do is bump everything down one line. And then this line would line up with that line and it wouldn't make a difference. It's not like they need the space. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I think that's very weird to have a column of figures and then a total and the column doesn't add up to the total. Um, but anyway, so these don't add up to that. And I guess we just have to accept that fact for now because it doesn't seem to be affecting anything else. But bottom line is oil and the SDR, no change. Oil, all other oils went, went up significantly. We have a, an 8 million barrel build of all other oils. And look at this, look what it was before. It was 424 to 438. That's a massive buildup. And then again to 444. So in two weeks, we've added 22 million barrels of all other oils. That's 11 million barrels a week. So, you know, when they say product, all right, products, the product supplied versus the build and the net build. <laughs> You know, it's like the, well, the net, the net build, you have to take out the oil of the oils, but the net build is, a, is like a million or two million barrels, right? So the way, when you hear them talk about uh, the supply and demand balance or the demand of the U.S., they're talking about the fact that, and they, and they know they're wrong. They know it's not the right way to do it, but they're taking 20 million barrels my, a day produced, so 140 million barrels a week, and they're subtracting the two million barrel bill and say, well, in that case, U.S. demand must have been um, 138 million barrels. It sounds logical, but the reality is we're exporting 2.4 million barrels a day, which is um, 14, 17.5 million barrels a week. So we're exporting an entire day's worth of what they call demand. And that's out of a week. So in other words, demand is about 15% lower in the United States than they pretended it. And that has repercussions all over the world because nobody realizes this. I mean, this is the problem is they, it seems very reasonable when they say a figure and they say, well, you know, if you're, if you're producing 20 million barrels and you end up with a 2 million barrel bill, you must be using 148 million barrels. And once you accept that premise though, which is so, happens all the time, that people, you know, people say, well, it's not really right, but it was a big deal. It's a huge deal because when you start when you start pitching the demand of oil to Russia and to, I mean to, to like Japanese investors and Chinese investors and traders all over the world, all of a sudden you're pretending there's a, a massive demand of oil that doesn't exist in the United States. Because their premise doesn't, they, they don't get the details, all they get is the same way that you would see a number out of China that says uh, Chinese oil demand is 8 million barrels a day. And you go, ooh, 8 million barrels a day. Blah, blah, blah. You know, you don't know what that is either. Now, we kind of know that China's not exporting any oil or anything like that. But, you know, you don't know the details. It's just a number. And that's the way they see our data. They see just a number. Of course, here we granulate it and break it down. But somebody in China is just like you are. They're, they're, reading, the, they're reading the news. They're reading a, a Reuters report. And the guy lists the one little, the one little factoid. And that's what they go by. And that's what they start making their, their trades and bets and so on and so forth on. Which, which basically, and the reason they do this is because it causes people to bid oil higher than it should be. So you're just faking demand. 
you know, logically we can see that there's no particular large demand for oil, that there's tons of surplus, that our reserves keep going up and up and up. I mean, it's obvious that that's happening, but, <clears throat> but yeah, I mean, look, here's eight, this is the total reserves. This is the, the key. Total reserves, 868, right? Last year. Total reserves now, 962. That's 80 million more barrels. And we're only halfway through the year. So that's uh, 26 weeks to get to 80 million barrels. That means we're averaging uh, 3 million barrels a week of bill. That's the average for 2019. Every single week for 26 weeks, we've averaged 3 million barrels of bill. And that's, and that's why the oil charts look like this. They're like collapsing. That, you know, all the time it was going up, I was saying it was bullshit and it really fell apart. Though. I thought the bullshit would continue until July and I was wrong. And it has completely collapsed now. It's a total disaster for them. And that's the reality of you, you can sweep shit under the rug and you can make up numbers and pretend all this stuff, but eventually someone's like, hey, what's all these barrels of oil sitting around? You can't hide it for that long. It's an 80 million barrel bill. That's a lot. That's 3 million barrels a week. I mean, that's just a crazy amount of oil. That's the entire, that's the entire amount of oil that we get from like non-OPEC, I'm, I'm sorry, from outside, other than Canada and Mexico, 3 million barrels is about as much oil as we import, other than Canada and Mexico. So that would, that's basically our entire imports from all over the world are, are not necessary. Of course, Mexico, I don't know what they're going to do with that. I don't know if they're going to scarf on oil. That'd be kind of funny. <laughs> you never know what's going to be the next tariff. All right, so what else is going on? Um, we just, just, just in chat, uh, went over the... Um, short-term portfolio review. And also the, uh, let's talk about the money tour portfolio. See, <clears throat> the money tour portfolio, that's the one I do quarterly on uh, Business News Network. And that portfolio is up 132%. Um, and we've been doing it, I don't know, since like September. Well, I can tell you here. Uh, when do we start this portfolio? My portfolio. We started the money tour portfolio September of 2017, so it's just about two years old. Um, where are we? So we only trade this quarterly. That means I have to every time I get on the show, I have to think ahead for three months, to like what positioning we want to be at, and so on and so forth. So I'm really pleased that in this particular cycle, I was last on the show two months ago. Uh, was May, April, yeah, like like sort of the end of April, I think was the last time I was actually on the show. And we hedged because I was worried the market would go down. It took a while and it took a dip, but it didn't take much of a dip. But we did some heavy hedging. But even even despite that, um, we are up from 125% to 132%. So we're up $7,000 uh in the in the last month which is you know it's a fifty thousand dollar portfolio for starters and they started with fifty thousand dollars on wait uh, yeah we started with fifty thousand dollars on nine six in 2017 uh, now we have seventy two thousand dollars cash so we have like one and a half times more cash than the portfolio started with we're only using thirty thousand dollars worth of margin so it's, it's an excellent little portfolio, and it's a no-touch portfolio. We don't do anything with it. Um, you know, we and this is the thing. It's like you don't have to adjust, and you don't have to panic, and you don't have to do things. If you have a good 
balanced portfolio. You're going to be able to ride out these crises. And the, it's not even a crisis, really. It was a 5% dip in the market or 10% dip, whatever the hell it was. It wasn't much of a dip, put it that way. Uh, in fact, well, we can look from, uh, from John Link's big chart. Let's see where that is. Yeah, it was a 10% dip. I mean, it was, it's, it's painful. No, it was. Well, yeah. All right, I'm going to close it. I'm, like, I'm really prevaricating here. It's about, yeah, it certainly looks like it's about a 10% dip. In fact, the Russell for sure went from 12.5 to 2.5. That is a 10% dip. The NASDAQ went from 20% up below 10%. I'll go to that. It's 10% dip for sure. All right. So. A ten, we wrote out a 10% dip. We're only 50% recovered from the 10% dip. And, um, and the portfolio actually made money despite that. That's fantastic. I mean, that's what you want your portfolio to do. I think we were down, the most we were down, I believe we were down to 115%. That's, a, that's an ugly hit. I don't want to take that kind of hit, especially from 128% where we were last month. You know, but what I mean, look, it, nothing's foolproof. Your positions are going to go up and down. And it's just up to you to say, how far off course is this? It's like, you know, it's like when you're, you're driving a boat and you steer the boat a certain direction, but the current pushes it one way and the other way. And then a wave comes, blah, blah. You don't constantly correct your course. You correct your course. When you start going broadly off course, you make a correction. If you constantly correct it, you go crazy. You're never going to be exactly on course because there's too many factors affecting you, even if you're heading generally in the right direction on a boat. And if a storm comes, you can go pretty wildly off course. Like every time a big wave hits, it can push your, the front of your boat left, it can push the front of your boat right, and you can be pretty far off course. But again, it's not worth adjusting every time you get hit because the next hit might put you back in the other direction. And, you know, we see that from the market. We see that from the way these things perform. Um, where's the futures? Here. So, you know, if you look at the hourly moves of the S&P over the month. So, I mean, here we are. This is basically, you know, it's not quite a month. But, you know, it's like you go down and then you go up and then you go up and down and up and down and up and down and up and down. But the bottom line is we're higher now than we were then. It seems drastic, but it's not. You know, here's a daily view. You know, especially here, look at this. We went up, be up, be up, and down, down, and up, and up, and down, and up, and down. And, and all this is just to get to where we were last year. We were we were at 2,700 last year. Now we're at 2,880. So that's 280. We're 10% higher overall for in, in the entire year. Been a hell of a ride. So I have a portfolio that's up, you know, 60% in that period of time. That's pretty freaking good. I'm happy. Um, and you guys, you know we can do this, right? You know we can do this very, very consistently. So... And, all right, <clears throat> I want to make a bigger point. So I'm gonna, all right, let's find a, um, gonna do a compound rate calculator. Great. Okay. That's one. All right, so you start out with uh, $250,000 to invest. And you have 20 years before you retire. And let's say we can make 20% a year for 20 years. That's $9 million. Okay. I, I, I want you guys to understand this. Okay. It's $9 million effing dollars. And you know how much money you're making year one? $50,000. Do you know how much money you make in year two? $60,000. Is there a table? Do they have a table? No, they don't really have a table. What do I just do? Compound rate, blah, 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 blah. See also. 
No, we stay at the table. Anyway, all right, doesn't matter anymore. All right, so that's 20 years. If it was 10 years, it's gonna make substantially less, whoops. In 10 years, it's $1.2 million, so 1.6. Still not bad. All right, in other words, if you have $250,000 now, and you have 10 years before you retire. If you just leave it alone and make 20% a year for 10 years, you'll have $1.6 million. I mean, you'll make over 10 years, $1.5 million. Not 1.5, sorry, 1.4, $1.4 million. And that's an average of 140,000 a year back on your $250,000. You have to be satisfied with that. You have to believe that's enough money. In 20 years, anybody, obviously, even if even if it's even if you start with $50,000 and you have 20 years. Wait, okay, sorry, 20 years. Oh, I changed the percentage rate to 10. That was silly. I'm sorry. We all screwed up. So if you have 20 years at 20%, that's $1.9 million in 20 years. I hit the wrong button before. Um, if you have 30 years, $11 million, $11 million, 30 years, okay? If you have a child or a grandchild or a nephew or a niece, and you can afford to give them $50,000 and set them up in a nice little fund that makes 20% a year, you will, give, you will be giving them in 30 years, $12 million. This is why you set up a family trust or something like that to manage the money. Um, you can manage it yourself, you can have a hedge fund manager, whatever you want to do. But the point is, it's all about, it's not about whether you make 50% or 60% or 80% a year. It's about steadily making 20%. Everything else is a bonus. All we ever aim for in our portfolios is to make 20%. And when there's an opportunity to do something better, we do it, which there often is. But the focus of what we're doing is to make 20% a year consistently because that is going to make anyone rich. Okay, unless, unless you're 65 now with $50,000 in the bank and you're freaking out about your retirement next year, <laughs> which a lot of people are, unfortunately. But, you know, you, you can easily win, do fantastically well with this strategy. And this strategy isn't that hard. We're doing it in, the, in every portfolio, for one thing. We're doing it in our hedge fund. The hedge fund's up 45% for the year, probably 50% now because of the rebound. Um, so, the head, you know, so, so we're doing it, in the head, we're doing it in every possible place we can do it. That's easy. 20% is easy. We're doing better than 20% in every portfolio, frankly. Um, it's not hard to make it in nice conservative trades. If you're not making that, then stop screwing around. Stop taking these crazy bets. Stop chasing after crap. You don't make up, you don't get back on track making 20% by, by, by jumping on some trade that's going to make a double or some hot stock that's going to go to the moon or whatever crap. No, you make the 20% by grinding it out on lots of diverse stocks that all appreciate over time in a strategy like our strategy. And I really, I don't know any better strategies. I don't. In fact, I just talked to them. I was just talking to the Maven guys um, about what's, you know, what's wrong with the street and such. And uh, we're going to get, I, <laughs> I mean, I mean, <laughs> I'm running that thing. Um, <laughs> I, I don't want to. I got too much stuff going on. But they're, they're like, wow, you should do this. <laughs> But, you know, the problem with all these people and all their idiotic strategies and so on and so forth is they are, they're trendy. They, they work sometimes, sometimes they don't work. Um, they work at a certain market condition, sometimes they don't work. 
we're playing a strategy no one else really plays. And our strategy is based on a very simple fact, which you guys are all sick of hearing. It's a be the house concept, right? And it's based on the absolute scientific mathematical fact that premium goes to zero over time. Therefore, if we sell premium and wait, we will make money. Okay, it's like when you're a kid in school and you're doing those things, all premium goes to zero over time. It's an absolute factual statement. Therefore, if Timmy sells $100 worth of premium and waits, how much money will he make in premium? Now, you don't make the money in your bet. That's different, okay? Because there's two, there's two things to what we're doing. When I sell, okay? Um, This is not, and of course, we're not talking about futures or anything else here. We're talking about good old-fashioned straight stock stuff. IBM's at 134. I would be thrilled to own IBM at $120. So if I sell the $120 puts for $10.50, I'm going to collect whatever. I would let's say $10. I collect $10,500, and I'm promising to buy IBM. For $120,000 and promising to buy a thousand shares of IBM. Now, that's a 10% uh, discount to where IBM is now, plus that's a strike, plus another almost 10%. So I'm getting you know close to 20% off if I if I get assigned, because I'll be assigned at net 110. So do I want to own a thousand shares of IBM at $110? And if the answer is yes, and if my portfolio is of a size where that would make sense to me, and if I really like IBM, and if it fits in with my overall portfolio, and if I have the money or the, or the buying power to deploy on that trade, then why would I not sell the put? Okay, there is risk. Of course, there's risk. There's risk of being assigned. There's risk it goes down instead of up. There's all the, you know, there's lots of risk in these things. But for a fact, the $10,500 I'm going to collect in premium will absolutely expire worthless. And that means that as long as IBM doesn't go bankrupt, if I sell $10,000 of premium every 18 months for uh, for 18, well, let's say for 18 years, right? Is that right? Am I saying that right? 18 months for, no, because it's a year and a half. So for 15 years, if I sell it every 18 months for 15 years, I will collect $100,000 plus dollars of IBM premium, which will in fact expire worthless. And therefore, even if I get assigned the stock at $100,000, my net cost of owning IBM will be zero. So as long as IBM doesn't go bankrupt, I will make the money. But that's contingent upon other things. Like obviously if I get assigned and I can't afford it and I have to sell it and blah, blah, blah. But as long as you're in the range of where you're comfortable and you're holding it long term and your worst case scenario is you end up getting assigned IBM on a big dip. And, and, and let's keep in mind that IBM, where's, where's Mr. Yahoo? So IBM is chart, 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 chart. All right. So IBM in wow. Oh, I see. No, no, no. Okay, here we go. So IBM in 2008 went from 125 or 128 to 75. All right, that's 50 out of 125 is 40%, uh, dropped 40%. IBM here went from 200 to 125. That's also, I think, 40%. So IBM, in a correction, can drop 40% on you. 
you have to be aware of that when you make the uh, when you when you say you're willing to hold the stock. So what are we doing? We're going to net 110. 40% of 150 though is 90. So if we have a 40% correction in IBM from here, it would take us down to 90, which is pretty much near the, the 2008 lows. Um, at that point, what would happen to us? Well, we'd be down $20,000 on our short scenario. But you know what? That's not so bad. Now, hopefully it won't go down so sharply like it did here that we can't roll our short puts. If it goes down like this, we'll roll our short puts. So this is these are years. This is uh, 2013, 14, 15, and all the way to 16. So this is this is four years for it to dip. So every if I if every every 18 months we're rolling down $20 lower and rolling down $20 lower and rolling down $20 lower, we'd be $60 lower. We'd be effectively at we were we're starting at 110 on ours for net. We'd be down to 60, and we wouldn't give a crap when it's at 125. <coughs> um, but if it happens like this, then we're screwed. Then if we so you know so here effectively we're at 150 selling the 120s. I'm sorry, we're at 134. It's even lower than that. It's a lower down here, but we're at 134 selling the 120s. So 10% lower. So if we were at 130 here and we sold the 120s and it suddenly dipped to 75, we would be out 50 bucks or, or 45 bucks. We'd be out 45 bucks. That's $45,000. So if you figure that's probably the worst case, probably the worst case, not definitely the worst case, obviously something horrifying could happen, but it's not very likely given the history of IBM and of course, it's just as likely it goes flying up. Obviously, it has, it has just as many instances of flying up as it does of flying down. So hopefully, we're catching it at the right time. But the point is, as long as I want, if I if I'm willing to own IBM and IBM doesn't go bankrupt on me, even that includes here, even burned as I was here, I would have certainly doubled down. I and, and and we did for sure. You know, I would certainly double down on IBM if it's at 75 because I'd be saying, I think this is ridiculous. How could IBM be $75? I could say a hundred reasons to buy IBM at that price. Um, at 200, I didn't find it attractive at all. At 150, I start to find it attractive again. That's why we have uh, some IBM in our portfolio. At, at 125, it starts getting silly, and at 100, it's ridiculous, and 75 is just freaking not double. I'll sell all the stuff to buy it. But also, I expect to be in it for years. If it takes, and Warren Buffett says that too. He says, if you're not willing to, <coughs> to hold a stock, if they close the market tomorrow for five to 10 years, you shouldn't be in it in the first place. You have got to be able to ride out a long-term dip. You've got to be able to survive a war or a, uh, an atomic bomb blowing up somewhere or whatever. You know, I mean, they could look, they could nuke a city in North America and the market would collapse and stay down for years because we'd be at war. We would be in some sort of like incredible, you know, we'd be in a, in a security alert that would make 9-11 look like a picnic. Um, commerce would stop, trade would be halted, every single thing on the ports would be inspected, every single person crossing the border would be would be strip searched. Um, it would be a nightmare. It'll, it'll, it'll shut this country down and shut the whole world down. I mean, the whole world will go crazy if something like that actually happens. Um, and, and it could happen, although, although it goes... I, you know, people say that's a terrible thing and so and makes it more worry about the world. I look at that and say, well, you know what? The fact that it's never happened gives me like real hope that people aren't anywhere near as bad as you think they are. Because it certainly could happen. It's not that hard to make an atomic bomb or especially a dirty bomb or something like that and blow it up in the city. Nobody does it because it's sick. And there aren't that many sick people. And then and, and so obviously this, there are sick people, but not necessarily sick people with all those skills. You really need a group that's very determined to do something incredibly horrible to make something like that happen. And that, that's what you can't find because people aren't that bad. And that's my attitude about it. I, I see it as a, as a positive. I see the fact that nobody, um, 
spot on. Yeah, I don't want to get morbid. But I mean, you know, nobody goes into a movie theater with a backpack full of explosives and blows up the theater. That's good, right? It's not, that's easy to do. Anybody can do that. My daughter's in movie theaters with backpacks all the time. It's like she, she never goes anywhere without a backpack. Um, they, they almost never check. When we go to Disney, they check. Um, the, most, most movies don't check. I, I can't even think of like where she gets checked. Um, I know I've seen her get checked at a movie once and I thought that was weird. But, but that's why that's why I can tell you for sure. Most places do not check. And obviously, uh, I'm in Florida now. You see these women who have handbags, the slug, you know, that, that may as well be a backpack. They don't get checked at all. Anybody, anybody could do this anytime they wanted to, and they don't. Because people aren't that crazy. Most the vast, incredible, large majority of people on the planet Earth, that includes Muslim people and other people that you don't like and whatever else, they none of them are willing to do something that horrible. I mean, yes, the guy shot up a movie theater, guy did this and that, but it's so easy to do and nobody really does it. Obviously with a billion people, if it's a one in a billion chance, it's gonna happen. But, but fortunately, human nature is not so horrible. So, what does that have to do with IBM? That to, what that has to do with IBM is that my confidence in having a portfolio where I don't believe that this is going to happen very often. And, uh, and here's, uh, in fact, there is obviously, here's 9-11. So 125 to 75, same thing, right? So 911. This this thing, this this financial crisis, that was what's unique. I mean, here was a terror attack on the United States. Here was uh, a bank collapse. Same thing, just as bad for the for the economy. But in both cases, five years later, you recover. So if you go into a conservative strategy. Getting back to my point, if you go into a conservative strategy portfolio that's designed to make a very steady 20%, yes, obviously in a year like this, you won't make your 20%, but the, as long as it comes back, you get back on track. You might lose two years. So instead of having 10 years compounded, you have eight years compounded out of 10. But you're not losing the actual money. It comes back and then you get back on track and start compounding again. Same thing here, even if it's flat here. See, here's the advantage of our strategy. Even though the market, well, not the market, IBM. Even though IBM was flat from 1999 to 2007, our strategy would have made us the 20% we were looking for. Then none, none of this variation, 25% up and down, would have bothered us in our strategies. We're still going to make our 20% every single year. And our strategy starts with things like selling those puts. But again, conservative, simple strategies, leaving lots of cash on hand, not taking any wild risks, not going after. I mean, I'm sorry. I don't say not taking any wild risks. We do take risks. We do buy some fun stocks. We do go for something like Helios and Matheson. And it, did, and it blew up in our face. It didn't work out. Um, we do have, uh, we do keep stocks and things that are, that, are, that are very tricky that might pay off, and sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. But it's in a very small proportion of our portfolio, and in no way, shape, or form is it possibly going to endanger our, our goal of making 20 to 40 percent consistently year after year after year. We would never do anything like that, never. It's not foolproof because in a market crash, we lose money. I mean, this, this, you can't help that if everything loses money. We get assigned the stocks, that's when we end up owning a bunch of stock. Then we sell calls against the stock that we own and make money that way. And again, if I sell a call, what is it, what am I guaranteed? I'm guaranteed to collect the premium. The stock goes up, if the stock goes down, I collect the premium. And that's why I know I can make 20% every single year. And that's why I'm, I have no fear financially. And it's not just a fear, though. It's not just that. It's if you can make that money and have a life. Because what's the point of putting money away for retirement 
and, and putting it in a portfolio and growing the portfolio so you have enough to retire if you don't enjoy your life between now and then. And that's what I see. I see too many people doing that. All right? or, or the less, though, <laughs> I, think, I think these lectures that I do have caused a lot of people on PSW to go out and do other things because a lot of people have, have told me they, they don't come online as much anymore because they, they just, you know, they, they, just, they started listening to what I was saying in the last cycle and just, you know, going for these conservative strategies where you don't have to be online all the time. You don't have to watch your portfolio all the time. You just set up a nice balanced portfolio and you adjust it once in a while. But when you feel like it and the rest of the time you can go travel, you can go see your family, you can visit your friends, you can go to places you used to love, you can sit and watch your waterfall. There's a million things you can do in life besides stare at a screen watching the stocks. And, and honestly, I don't know that many people who really make mu much more than 20 to 40 percent a year consistently. I know guys who make 100 percent. I know guys who doubled up and they brag about it all day long. But when you say, OK, well, over the last 20 years, have you done? Eh, you know, so pretty, pretty good. Not great. <laughs> yeah, that's what, that's what always happens. These guys, I get guys all the time coming to me. Oh, Phil, you know, I, I made this and that. And I'm like, yeah, well, that's nice. But how are you doing over like, the last 10 years? And it's just not real. No, I mean, you would know it if there was. There are very, very few people who pull that kind of performance. Warren Buffett, 16% a year is his average. 16% a year, but he does it all the time. He does it consistently for 50 years. Here, you want to know what Warren Buffett does? Here's $50,000, 16%, 50 years, $85 million. That's what Warren Buffett does. Okay, $85 million doesn't buy what it used to buy in 19, what year is this? Uh, 1970, only 1970, I was alive then. That's crazy. Um, 85 million doesn't buy what it used to buy in 1970. Really? Yeah, I guess it is, 1569. Okay, wow, god damn. That's terrible. You know, it's a bad realization when you think of like, I was totally alive when back in this ridiculously long time ago. Right? I see 50 years, I'm like, damn, I was even alive then. Um, I'm only, I'm 56. So for me, it's like, kind of, it's still kind of new to think that I'm like alive that long. Or not just alive, but I remember what I was doing back then. I used to deliver newspapers and there was a sign on the highway of a Volkswagen Beetle and it was 19, the brand new Volkswagen Beetle, 1999. And that is exactly what I was doing. I was delivering newspapers and I was saying I have to save up. And, and you know, when you're a kid, you don't really think of like making more money. So like you think you're gonna be like a paper boy for like five years. So I, I literally was thinking that I was gonna be a paper boy for five years and save up, you know, uh, $400 a year and buy this car. Um, that, was, that was my entire ambition. That was all I, all I was aiming to do though. But I just, I always will remember that, like in that, so basically that was, I was 10, so that was 1973. So in 1973, I could have bought a brand new car for 2,000 bucks. So now, even the Beetle, that I think the Beetle is probably $25,000 now, so 25 times more. So still, you divide 80 million by, well, first of all, you have to divide the 50,000, so it's 2,000. So how did I save that one Beetle at $2,000? 83 um five three five divided by 25 3.3 million dollars okay so in other words yeah i want you to say so so in other words two thousand dollars we're ignoring inflation now so two thousand dollars in relative buying power so if i had not bought that beetle and i had given warren buffett my money in 1969 i didn't i would you know obviously the timing is different but and I not bought the Beetle and give him Warren Buffett my money. Today, I would have $3.3 million at Berkshire Hathaway. All right. And so I'd be basically okay to retire. I mean, it depends how ambitious you are. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking I, I need more than that, but <laughs> I'm a little, my lifestyle ratcheted up a little bit since I was a kid. I'm no longer, I'm no longer happy with just that much. Um, but 
you know, even so, that would be lovely, right? And then, frankly, though, you know, and there, there's the thing, though, if I go, if I went with, um, well, let's take this amount, if I take this amount of money, and I let that go for another, let's see, I'm 56 now, so let's say I'm going to retire at 70, so if I go 14 more years and I keep making 16%, it's going to go to $26 million. In 14 years, it's going to make $23 million. It's going to make $2 million a year on the average. And again, it seems like not much when you make 16% the first year, but if you leave the freaking money alone and let it compound and let it grow again and again and again, and you consistently grow it, it turns into a huge amount of money. I'm pretty sure in 14 years, I'll be happy with $26 million. I'm not happy with $3 million now, but in 14 years, if I had $26 million, I think I can probably get, I think I can make it to the, uh, to the end with that. So, um, it's all about consistently making money. And you can consistently make a reasonable return. And I think a reasonable return is 20 to 40%. You can consistently make that four out of five years in the market. And realistically, 15 out of 20. I mean, sorry, 16 out of 20. So realistically, 16 out of 20 years in the market. You will have four bad years every 20 years for sure. But it's not a loss per se because you're going to leave the money in the market if you follow the strategy and it will recover with the market. And then you just start going forward again from, the, from that amount. So in other words, if I have 3.3 million now and next year sucks and we drop 20% and I end up with 30% uh, with, uh, less and I end up with 2.3 million, let's say, took a terrible hit the first year, all right? If the market recovers back to my 3.3 million in two years, then going forward, I have 18 years still to, to go make that money. I'm going to make it in 18 years. What I've lost is two years of my gains, and it sucks, but, but that's happened. Now, of course, that's why I have that's why I have a hedging portfolio as well. And it's the same thing, though. You can go away with a the, with the hedging portfolio. It's just your hedges are going to cost you money to maintain. But that avoids that big dip. When you have a when you have a big dip in the market, it avoids hitting you really hard. And and generally, as you know, when we have a dip, we consider that more of a buying opportunity than a time to panic out of things. In fact, I'm much more likely in my trading style to panic out of things that have gotten too much money. When I make too much money, I get more nervous than when I lose money. I'd say it's definitely true about my trading styles. Like when I, if, if I see a position that has made a ton of money, like in our hedge fund, and thank God, because that's one of the reasons we're up so much in the hedge fund, our Apple position made a fortune and we, we cut it because <laughs> it was stupid. I say, and you know, Doug and I had a conversation. Um, I think it was 140 uh, ish or something. No, where were we? No, we're until 140. I'm so, I'm so, I'm like, so behind 200, it's over 200 back here. And I felt uncomfortable. And I said, let's just get out, let's cash it. I mean, we took another long-term position that's more conservative, but the aggressive position we had, and why do we have an aggressive position? Because back here, when it dipped, we bought a lot of it and took a very aggressive position. We had the 120 calls. We had a whole bunch of Apple 120 calls and they weren't even covered. And it went up and up and up. And, and, and once it got it past where it was high before, I started getting more. It held here. And then it went to two. And I said, that's it. I can't take it anymore. I can't, I can't have freaking calls that are worth $80 each. We had a lot of them. We were up like $400,000. And I said, let's cash this. I don't want that risk. I don't want to hold it. I don't like the fact that it's so high. And what did we do? Then when we had this dip, what did we do? We rolled down our calls that we had bought to a lower strike, and now we're a little bit more aggressive again. But those are the only adjustments we make. We made adjustments here, and then we got out here, and then we took some more over here, and now we're waiting to cover. And we're probably going to cover now. We're getting back around 200. We're going to cover again. But that's it. That's like, so for my year, I could just do that. You can be on a yacht doing that. You don't really sit there and stare at the market all day long. You can just go in and check on it once in a while. Um, 
And that's what you should be doing. It's like, it's not enough to just, you know, plan your future and whatever, but you should be able to enjoy your life while you're doing it. And it shouldn't be constantly worrying about every day what the market's going to do up and down and so on and so forth. So, you know, I mean, even if you like these aggressive things and so on and so forth, I would really like it if you guys at least experiment with a small portfolio that's steady and consistent so that you can watch it for a few years. And that's, that's what I've been doing. I mean, I the last batch, and I said this is 18 months ago now, when we set up these new portfolios, I said, I want to emphasize leaving, you know, just portfolios that grow over time and show the power of just compounding and letting everything run. Now, we're, we're having more success, obviously, than we intended. We're making uh, quite large amounts of money in some of our portfolios, but the point is still the same, though. This is how you want to manage your account. Okay, if you, want to, if you want to make a lot of money and you want to set up your family for the future and you want to set up your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren, these are the kind of accounts you want to have. Because, you know, my kids are not going to be day trading. I wish they would. Jackie would probably be good at it. Uh, Maddie, would be, Maddie would actually be a good um, value trader. She's very, very value-oriented. Um, you know, Jackie's got great instincts, but it's not she hates it. She doesn't she has no interest whatsoever. So she's not here. So so they're not gonna take over the companies and so forth. So I have to think about what's gonna sustain my family down the road. And so I'm gonna set up a long-term family trust that will reinvest and reinvest and reinvest in these simple strategies. Now, the trick is to find people to run the strategies over the next hundred years, but that's that's basically the plan. And just let the money grow. You know, write write checks a little bit checks to everybody every every all the time. Right? You know, my sons will get checks on a regular basis, but most of the money will be put into a fund that grows and grows and grows. And it's going to grow along these simple lines. I mean, it's it's got to be something that that anybody can run. And that's what these strategies are. These aren't, I'm not, you know, we're not being complicated. Because we're here watching the markets, we'll do timing moves. All right. But that just takes your fund, you know, that just takes a fund manager, a guy like me, to watch things for you and send out an alert when things are going to change. And all you have to do as far as working on these things is go check on the site and say, hey, did anything exciting happen? Are there any major changes? You don't have to catch it that day or that minute. We don't time things out that much. In fact, I'm usually ahead of things. We got out of Apple a bit early. We got out of, um, oh, on SQQQ. Um, I think we made our change on like June, th on, on not June, May 30th. I think we got a thing on May 30th. Oh, well, that's exactly right there. Yes, yeah, like May 29th, I think. On May 29th, we, we took our SQQs off the table. It went up to like 40, uh, it went way higher than what we thought it was going to go because we came in here and we got this incredible run and we made a ton of money on our long SQQQs. We took it off the table. We put on a different, same with that, same thing we do with Apple. We took the, the aggressive one off the table, put on a more conservative one, left some short calls to die on the vine, and they did. And now that SQQQ is back down, we're going to be, uh, we, we are being a little more aggressive in our roles and so on and so forth with SQQQ. So we're set up for the next dip. And the, ne the next dip takes, the next dip in the NASDAQ, which takes SQQ higher. But those are complicated. <laughs> but the point is not to be greedy. So like I said, if anything, so here's, I don't know, that's, this is probably the, the last day of May. So, you know, we, this I considered enough, and it was enough. I, you know, I'm not wrong just because the next day it went up more. This was enough because it went up and down in two days, and then it started going down. So this was still the top. It just poked over the top. But I don't have to get the exact right second. We, we cashed out an incredibly profitable position. And that's all you need. And again, if you're not going... If you're not trying to make 100%, it's easy to make 20% because I don't have to be greedy. 
I just make sensible moves. That was a big game. Therefore, I take it off the table. I'm not waiting for a bigger gain. I don't care. As long as I make my 20%, I'm happy. That's how I think about every position. Once I make my 20%, I'm happy. That's all I've ever wanted. That goes my futures trading too, okay? I put a futures contract in. It's a $4,000 um, profit margin thing. Um, I mean, mar it's a margin on my on my account. If I make a thousand bucks, I'm like, holy crap, that's great. And but but, but of course, as a day trade, if I make three hundred bucks, I think that's great. You make five percent a day off of, off your risk. What? How much is that? That's ridiculous amounts of money. And you got to keep that in perspective. And you can't expect to get more when you make five or ten percent a day. You've got to understand you're not going to make three thousand percent a year. That's not how life works. I don't care how good you are, you're not making no 3,000% a year. So making 10% a day is crazy. Making 5% a day, crazy. Making 1% a day is really good because there's only 200 trading days in a year. You're doing 200% a year. Unless that's your average, you should really think about, wow, that's good money. I should lock that in. But, you know, I really, I, I, I can't, it bothered me so much because, like, to hear, like, some people were losing money. I, I got, um, you know, we're raising money for our, uh, our our new cannabis hedge fund. And, oh, and, and, and by the way, our regular hedge fund is going to be taking money, by the way. We're going to uh, accept uh, new people in July. So if anybody's interested in that, that's just perfectly normal market bet. So if you want someone to just do all this for you, that's, you know, that's what the hedge fund is for. Um, but the cannabis fund is going to be huge. I'm, I'm thrilled with that. Um, so we're raising money for the cannabis fund. And, that's why, and, and some of the people I talked to back in, um, in April and May, as of a couple of weeks ago, had gotten hit really hard with the dip. And I'm like, why? And it's because they got too aggressive in the market. They thought that the bull rally was going to keep on going. They left their positions on too long. They got too greedy. And suddenly they got hit. And um, and that's it's a shame. I mean, I don't. It's, and it's because it's because you're playing it wrong. If you're doing that, though, you're playing the market wrong. If the market drops 10% and you don't think that's a buying opportunity because you have 50% of your cash on the sidelines and now it's getting a little more interesting, you're doing it wrong. Okay, we, we are almost never more than 50% invested except when there's a dip. And if the market drops 10%, I'll probably take 10% off the sidelines and go 60% invested. The market drops 20%, I'll take another 20%. Half of what I have left, I'll take and put in. And if the market drops 60%, I will be all in. And hopefully the market never drops 80% because then I'll be uh, screwed. And I'll start again with 50,000 bucks. <laughs> but still, you know, and I say this to people, you know, there's people, you know, ask me all the time, whatever, and small investors. And I say, look, just scrape together. You know, especially people starting out, like, just look, you you have to make your your mission in life at whatever age you are to get $50,000 together. Preferably 100,000, because then you can do portfolio margin and stuff, which, which really enhances your ability to, to sell premium. Um, you get $50,000 together. And if you can make 20% for 15 years, that's almost a million bucks, $770,000 in just 15 years. Usually I'm telling this to younger people though, and they have 30 years. And then it's $11 million. Now, there is pretty much no job you're going to have for 30 years that's going to pay you $11 million. And this is, this is where people plan their lives wrong. Because, you know, when you're young and making 40, 50, $60,000 a year, 
that's the time that you have to knock yourself out. This is, this is, by the way, a miseducation of the public and everything else, because what do they tell you to do? They tell you to save up for a home and give $50,000 to the bank and, and obligate yourself for a mortgage where if, if you buy a $400,000 home with a $350,000 mortgage, you're going to pay, I'd say, $500,000 probably probably more like six hundred thousand dollars to the bank for the house for the fear or fear four hundred thousand dollar house you'll pay a good six hundred thousand dollars to the bank plus you'll pay taxes on the house and you'll pay maintenance and all this all this money when you're young could have been put into an account like this and by the time you would have paid off your mortgage on your four hundred thousand dollar home and don't forget that that includes a lot of extra money you're putting in it, you know, over the years. By the time you pay off your mortgage, you will have maybe a million dollar home, maybe a two million dollar home. You are not going to have eleven point eight million dollars. Whoops. Yikes. That's it. <clears throat> so, um. Where were we? Oh, yeah. So, you know, and I wrote an article about this. I, it's a shame, though. You know, I, I guess I probably should write a book because I mean, I, I write these articles, but, but then obviously nobody's looking at my articles from two years ago. But I wrote an article explaining this. So, you have way, way better things to do with your money than put a, put a deposit on a house. Stop that. What are you, crazy? The same guy. All right. Yeah, it's off now. Um, where was I? Oh yeah. <clears throat> anyway, it's not about whether or not you're paying for the home. This is what people don't understand that they see. And this is again it goes back to because people think investing is gambling. People think investing, and it is gambling for most people because they don't know how to invest. But people think investing is a 50-50 thing. So in other words, they're like, well, I could take my $50,000 and flip a coin in the market and win or lose, or I can put it on the sensible house and pay that. But that sensible house costs a freaking fortune. It sucks up all your money. It's not the smartest investment. In fact, it's one of the reasons that city people end up having more money than country people. You would think it'd be the other way around because the country people invested in a home and they don't have an apartment and they bought a house and blah, blah, blah. But it doesn't work that way because the city people tend to take the money they would have spent on a deposit, take the money they would have spent on cars and so on and so forth, and they end up investing it in the market. And even relatively dumb investments if they just you know, if they're not if they're not gambling with it, they just put it into something like a mutual fund or whatever, and, and it grows. They end up with a ton of money, and so by the time their country friends sell their houses, the city friends are like, "Well, I have three million bucks in the bank, you know, from from the stocks." You know, they're like, "Oh, that's nice." And you see that all the time. You see, you always, see people, you always hate those people, right? Who are like, oh, "I couldn't believe it. I got so much money." <laughs> and if you leave it alone, even if it's ten percent, even if you make ten percent on the market for thirty years. 872,000. So, you know, and, and these people, obviously, if they're putting 50,000 in, if they get a sensible apartment and they and they don't spend too much money, they end up putting more and more money in the market. Oh, here you go. Annual addition. Watch what happens if you take $50,000 and put 5,000 in. Five, I'm sorry, $5. 5,000 in every year. Five, so $50,000 saved now. Put in $5,000 a year, 30 years at just 10%. $1.7 million. That's what you do instead of buying a house. Now, what if you put it into something and make 20%? $18 million. $18 million because you take, you be, like I said, you've got to kill yourself. You've got to do whatever it takes to scrape $50,000 together and not to buy a freaking house. But, the, but see, this is the problem because you can go to your parents and say, I want to borrow $50,000 to buy a house, right? That makes sense to them. But if you go to your parents and say, I want to buy, I, I need to borrow $50,000 to put in the stock market, 
what are they going to say? What are you crazy? You know, you're going to gamble my money? You're going to take $50,000 and do this? That's, that's where everyone's got it wrong. It's, it's the most biggest miseducation in America. And, it's because, and, and you're miseducated because the banks want it that way. Because obviously, who's competing for your money? The banks want your money. They don't want you to put it in the market. They want you to put it in your house and then borrow a lot of money from them so they can collect interest from you, which is the exact opposite of you making money. And you're going to gamble on your home appreciating. And let me tell you something. I, I bought my house 20 years ago. There wasn't much appreciation in 20 years. So, you know, it's like they, 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 that's gambling. And, and, not, and not to mention, I mean, the, you know, one of the reasons I left Jersey is I was paying $25,000 a year tax on a home that I had originally bought for $400,000. 25000 a year. My taxes were more than my mortgage by a long shot. That was just my tax bill every single year. It's insane. I mean, obviously, the home went up in value and so on and so forth. But, it, 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 you know, in 20 years, I put a half a million dollars of taxes in. I didn't, well, the taxes went up. When we started, the taxes were like 3500 and they went up to twenty five thousand. And that's why people get that's why people get out of the state. That and the state tax is bad and all this million reasons. I'm a, I'm basically a tax exile from New Jersey now. Um and, and again, why? Because this bothers me. Because this is money I could be putting in instead of putting it into New Jersey and paying them property taxes. My rent, you know, it, you know. It, if you rent, it's less than that. It's a lot less. But um, what was I going to say? Oh yeah. So instead, so, so I look at it and say, this is what I'm doing. I'm, I'm not. I'm not. It's not just that I'm paying the money. It's that I'm robbing my children. I can set up accounts for my kids and put fifty thousand dollars in the accounts and add five thousand dollars a year. And by the time they're forty or fifty, by the time they're my age, they'll have twenty million dollars. That's what I want to do. Not stay in my house in New Jersey because it's nice for my children. Because they don't, you know, because so they have a place to go, so they can go back to where they live. What am I doing? When they go back, I can get a freaking hotel. They can go back anytime they want and stay in New Jersey. I'm very happy to, to for a month and put them up in a place that costs 200 bucks for a night and it costs 6,000 bucks for the one month a year they're in New Jersey instead of $25,000 in taxes. And plus the rent, and plus the mortgage, and everything else. I mean, it's, it's insane. But people don't think about it that way because they don't think of the market as being something you can consistently make the money in. It's seen as risky, whereas owning a home is not, and that's completely and utterly incorrect. And and you and 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 you guys, if you have, you have to have that mentality too, because you are gambling on a lot of risky stocks when you should be invested. And again, it goes back to, you've got to start understanding that these conservative strategies are gonna make you just as rich as all the gambling you wanna do. As much money as you wish you could make on this stock and that stock and that stock, you absolutely can make if you don't do that. And that's the difference. All right, now let's see some questions. Uh, Tangled says, will PSW Investments have a share in the cannabis fund? Yes, it's going to be like like the hedge fund, which PSW Investments owns, owns a part of the management. Not the fund. We're not putting cash into the fund, although we might down the road. Um, we, But we don't have that much cash that we're going to throw it around into a fund like that. But we're going to own the management company or part of the management company. Um, obviously, there's going to be the head traders. They're going to have a share. Some of the investors are going to have shares, so on and so forth. But we'll own a piece of the management company. That's how we make the money. And also, we'll participate in some of the things that we, you know, it is good. <laughs> so, but you know, when the hundred million dollars that goes into the fund, that belongs to the people who put the money in. It's not our money. We only get money if we successfully manage it and turn a profit. Then we get twenty percent of whatever we make. Uh, less, you know, about a percentage of that anyway. So Randy says, wow, for some reason, I'm not sure why. Uh, <laughs> and then Brian says, oil is down more. That's that's terrible. 
Let's take a look. I, I oh wow, ooh, <laughs> that's a wow, look at that. What's the dollar doing? Where's the dollar? Huh? Dollar's still strong. That's really terrible. Sixty bucks. See, Brent, sixty. That and it, it's kind of testing sixty. This is, I mean, I think fifty-one fifty or fifty, and obviously fifty-one. So down around here, I think is 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 again trying to go long again. I'm up, you know, obviously it's been having a rough time. What else looks exciting? Anything else? Uh, da, 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 da. What's copper doing? What? No. Oh. Copper is 265. Seeing copper goes up and down, whatever the latest trade rumor is. That's how copper goes. Gasoline, 169. Wow, this is tragic. Oh, I wonder what happened. Did somebody say something bad? Let's read some news. Let's see. Market news live feed. I don't like that. I want to see the regular news. Oh, that is it. Um, Vox. Energy crude, crude oil move lower. Blah, 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 blah. And gaming, who cares? Ford. Had a recall. They got hit. You see, now see, when you see this stuff, you know, Ford, they $180 million in cost. You look at Ford and say, well, you know, they make a lot more than that. So it's not it's not materially a, an effect on the company. <laughs> you know, Ford made four billion dollars last year. They made eight billion the year before. So they're in the four, four to eight billion dollar range in profit. And so when you see that Ford law is is going to hit hundred get hit by one hundred eighty million dollars, that's first of all it's pre tax. So, you know, they take, well, they don't pay that much taxes, but, you know, let's say they take off 25% of that after tax. So the net to their bottom line is going to be about um, $120 million out of $4 billion. So, you know, it's weird when you see things affect stuff, but that's, you should always be doing that math when you're investing in something or when you're thinking of investing in something. Because if you see, if, if, it, if they're down 0.2%, obviously it's not a big thing. But if they've been down like 10% on, on news like that, you have to go, whoa, that's stupid. You know, Boeing, on the other hand, they, they're grounded until December now with those 737s. And now those costs are going up and up and up. They're going to get hit for much more than a billion dollars on that. And, uh, and that's without lawsuits or anything. So, you know, you got to figure conservatively, Boeing will get hit for about $2 billion on this uh, Thing, and then you look at Boeing's profits and you say, well, they made 10, that's 20% of their profits. And, and maybe last year was a particularly good year. So then you see, then you then you look at Boeing and say, okay, well, 20% of their profits, let's say they make $8 billion, they're at $194 billion. That means Boeing is now trading at uh, 194 divided by eight, 25 times earnings, 24 times earnings. Not 17 times earnings. I mean, not 20 times earnings. They're, they're trading like 24 times earnings. And that tells you don't buy Boeing yet. They're not really cheap. This is a, this is a bad, bad event that happened to them, and it's going to take a while. And, and, it's, and the amount of money that they're getting hit for is not nothing to them. The amount of money Ford got hit for is nothing. The amount of money Boeing gets hit for is a lot. And with every company, you have to evaluate that. You have to think about, like, what happened? What's the news? What's the repercussions? What's the worst case? What's the best case? And then decide whether or not it merits the move that happened. That's the best thing about reading the news. And most of the time, the move gets it right. And, and I ignore it. I mean, but once in a while, as you guys know, I constantly am reading the news. And um, once in a while, I'll sit there and I'll look at something and I'll do the math and I'll think about it. And I'll say, that doesn't make any sense. And then I want to jump in. So de Blasio plans to make a cap on Uber and Lyft driver's license permanent. Uh, the city can hold new licenses after a surge of vehicles. The state has passed congestion pricing. Uh, the mayor's cap will create another medallion system. That's true. Uh, the same kind of bankrupted drivers and rich lenders. 
That's true too. Not only is the mayor's policy hurting app drivers by forcing them to pay exorbitant fees to rent a car, uh, but he has proposed nothing to fix the current medallion system that only benefits lenders and tax systems. And that's weird because De Blasi is pretty uh, socialist. Um, I don't know. I mean, there's pros and cons. I mean, the, the city streets are saturated with Uber drivers, and there's still tons of taxis. So you got tons of taxis, and then you know, Uber and Lyft is every half the cars on the road are Uber and Lyft driving around waiting for someone. It's so funny. I mean, when you go to when you push an Uber button in New York City, you see like eight cars within a block of you, like waiting waiting for a rider. Um, and they have the nerve to charge surge pricing. I'm like, how is it surge pricing when you can't even, you know, when, when literally half the cars on this block are, are guys waiting to pick somebody up? Ooh, Trump is holding a news conference with Poland's president right now. What are we going to talk about? They're going to buy some missiles from us, I bet. That's always fun. All right. So meanwhile, there's not much news here that should make the market go lower. Uh... Huawei is urging Verizon to license patents. Hmm, that's interesting. Um, JP Morgan sees quantum. <laughs> wow, wow. Whoa, how would you pay this analyst? JP Morgan sees quantum computing paying off years from now. Wow, really, JP Morgan? <laughs> Holy crap. Seriously, you get to write a whole report that Shen's team has proved the scale. Oh, no, that's the scientist. I'm more worried about the analysts here. Ming Shen, wait, the managing, no, this is the guy. Wait a minute. I'm going to read that. The technology is years away from changing the way banks count, bank, the bank calculates financial models. Ming Shen, the director of quantitative research, oh, paying off for them. <laughs> I'm like, what are you talking about? Yes, that's true. It's not going to pay off to J.P. Morgan. Probably. No, we, quantum computing is so complicated. <laughs> It's going to take a very long time before they can make real good use of it, but it's very cool stuff. It's because it's not the same as just having a really fast computer. You have to use a whole different coding systems and everything. Um, it's going to take years to deploy technology due to the hardware required in creating new quantum-based algorithms, like I just said. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it is, it is interesting. Um, Wow. Okay. Well, whatever. <laughs> That's why we like to invest our money, because I don't know if I'll have a job in 10 years. These freaking computers tell you what to do. Um, Dominion, Four Seas Victory, who cares? Wells Fargo, who cares? Um, wow. Wow. Look at new meme. Lots of, how many freaking funds do they have? Fuel cell energy. Oh, oh my God. Seriously? Oh, this cracks me up. All right, where are we? Oops. Oh, that's why they went up 50%, because look, they were down there. I didn't know they were like almost bankrupt. What the hell? They're higher. They have a license agreement with Exxon. Training is resumed. Fuel cell says deal grants Exxon non-exclusive worldwide license to use its patents and blah, blah, blahs uh, to exploit carbonate fuel cells in applications which fuel cell concentrate and industrial. Hmm, interesting. Okay. Exxon's only paying them $10 million. Well, let me see something. So, so, and again, see, this is the thing. Then you go back and say, well, let me, let me understand this. Why is this suddenly being treated like such a big deal? So F C E L. They only have an eight million dollar valuation, and Exxon just gave them ten million dollars. Obviously, very helpful, right? Um, financially, they had eighty nine million in revenue and lost fifty million last year. Um, that's not cool. Quarterly, seventeen million in sales, seventeen million in losses. Hmm, not my favorite kind of company. Um, obviously, you know, you're in this kind of company for the patents and such, but, mm, I don't know. They're, they're very dangerous. It's, it's, it's a shame because they did have a lot of promise. Yeah. And, and of course, Exxon makes it sound like they're commercializing it and things, but then you have to start thinking, say, well, you know, 
Samsung is a massive, massive company, and all they're doing is what Apple did when Apple went with, um, well, first of all, Apple gave, gives liquid metal money, right? Liquid metal never goes anywhere. Um, Apple always pays liquid metal for an exclusive license to use their stuff. That's how liquid metal survives, is because every year Apple writes them a check. Because what Apple is saying is if we can get this thing working, and, no, and Apple and liquid metal have both been unable to create a mass-produced version of liquid metal enough that you could actually make an iPhone case or something out of it. Um, and, and liquid metal is, is extremely light, extremely flexible for metal and um, impact resistant, whatever. It's like the phone is its own case, basically. Um, huge advantages to using it as a phone, as a, in a phone case, but cost prohibitive at the moment and cannot be, no matter what you want to spend, they couldn't even make uh, a million of them. There's no way. It's, it's just not, it would take years and years and years to make the, 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 the number of cases you need. It's just not worth it. So, not cases, case things. You know, the actual body of the phone would be made out of this stuff is the theory. Um, but Apple keeps licensing it because they would hate it if Samsung got it. So that's how that works. Um, this is the same thing for Exxon. They may just be interested and fuel cell is interesting and $10 million to Exxon is nothing. So it doesn't mean that fuel cell is suddenly going to make a ton of money with Exxon. It's just that Exxon is exploring the possibility. And that's good for them, but it's, it's certainly not going to save the company when it's burning. And that's the thing. So as nice as that story might sound, this is a company that's burning $17 million a quarter. As much as they sell, they lose. And their balance sheet has, well, has a little 10 million more now, has about $38 million. If you assume Exxon gave them 10 million bucks just now, they got about 38 million bucks. So you got two quarters before they have to borrow money or sell more stock and dilute you or something. Okay, so it's not a, a, not a good thing. Let's see, um, cash flow wise, we can see if they sold any stock or whatever lately. See, they borrowed $15 million um, that last year, last quarter. That is last quarter. They borrowed $15 million last quarter, so that's half the money they have they borrowed. So they're piling up debt in addition, right? They haven't sold stock yet, but they're gonna have to do, they're gonna have to either borrow money or sell stock to make it to the end of the year, even with Exxon's money. And even and then, and then you have to say, okay, so, so what's your bullish case? Well, let's say Exxon, um, does develop something and starts buying it and then shares the profits with these guys and whatever, that's all great, but that's not gonna happen in six months. That's not gonna happen in, a, it's barely gonna be happening in a year. They're buying it, it said in the, in the clip, to explore the possibility. You're talking about a year, two years of research, so on and so forth. That doesn't solve their problem now at all. Their problem is they're gonna run out of money and either dilute people to hell or go bankrupt very shortly. And, and I'm sure this deal with Exxon, giving me a license is probably a great deal for Exxon because Exxon, Exxon's like, dude, you want some money or not? And of course they need the money. So that's how when I read that news, I'd be like, okay, well that's interesting, but not helpful because you know I'm surprised fuel cell went up that much. Seems like too much. I wouldn't short it because who knows what's actually going to happen. I also certainly wouldn't jump into them because it doesn't look like a healthy company at all. And the amount of money they got isn't going to make a difference. And a non-exclusive worldwide license um, to use their stuff, blah, 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 blah. This is real long-term stuff. This is not going to happen soon. Um, Coles, uh, surprise they're still there. <laughs> Semi slides, every course he's a recovery. No, we know that already. The street, ah, this is so great. I mean, we talked about that, right? So the Maven, we're we are PSW is, is we're on the Maven. We we provide content to the Maven, um, and we also uh, you know we're pretty close with the owners of these guys. I didn't tell us this though. I didn't know they were buying the street. I guess they felt I was too inside to know that or something. Um, but this is very interesting, and the street went for a very low price. Um, they only paid 16.5 million bucks. 
Um, <laughs> that, that seeing the company shed its oh no that's the street the street did a business review so the street's already that, that's the end of them they're done um possible exit of jim kramer wow that's interesting i thought he'd stay on mm. the company wants to have a market cap like that now the maven of course is a penny stock so it's weird like they had to obviously borrow this money so they they must be they must be giving up a huge something to do this, but I don't care. We're looking at it strategically um, as PSW because it's like, what are we going to do now? They they're really interested in, in us doing something and taking over um, some functions over there, but we're I'm I don't have time. <laughs> it's a problem. Why I got too much stuff going off. Um, but we'll see. I will I will talk to them. We'll see what we can work out because there's a lot of interesting possibilities here. Um, that, you know, but I don't know to what extent the street, you know, the street was good a year ago, two years ago as a marketing machine. It's just like relentless marketing of their products. Now, I don't know. They dismantled so much stuff. I'm not sure what's left in that. So we're going to have to look at it closely. Um, so we'll see what happens, but it's weird. A new financial vertical, power and important voice delivering leading market financial insights. See, I'm already, you know, me and Mitch are like they're two top financial guys now. So we shall see what happens. Uh, Bank of America focuses on a hub, American CEO. So there's nothing here that should be tanking the market. That's what's weird. There's really nothing happening, and certainly nothing about oil at all. And we are on Market Feed News Live. I mean, see, I, I'm pretty sure we're getting all of it. I don't think we're filtering here. So it's interesting because this is a, um, there's, there's really no particular reason. So I have to, so logically, you have to figure it's probably the strong dollar. Oh my God, look at this. You, you, it seems like it's a strong dollar, but these guys are falling apart. Brent just failed 60. That's horrible. Oil is just a collapsing thing. Look at 60, 168 on gasoline. Holy crap. <laughs> some bad stuff so it's like i said this morning though so that's probably causing chevron and exxon to, to fall and um c v x yeah chevron's down uh it, it was not terrible for the dow chevron's down a uh, buck 50 and exxon is down only a dollar 18 it's only 250 it's not it's only costing them 20 points on the dow those two guys um but just generally, the energy sector has got to be dragging the S&P down and then the, and, and the down a little bit. So this is terrible. This is going to get worse. This is, these aren't even really affected yet. It's going to actually be worse. And then, we, and then this morning, and again, this is, you know, this is all we're doing. You know, as a fundamental investor, that's all I do is I read the news and I think about how it's going to affect stuff. So every morning I read the news and then I talk about what I think was important. And... Um, you know, it's the way the way my process works in the mornings. I sit there, I read the news, I watch Bloomberg or something. I don't watch CNBC. I hate CNBC. I only watch it because you have to. Um, oh, Trump's having that news conference too. God knows what they're saying there. All right. Anyway, um, so I, I read the news and then I'll start writing my article and, and and decide what I thought was the most important things to talk about for the day. You know, and sometimes it's nothing, and sometimes it's this. And, and you know, I try to, like, I try, if, if everybody's talking about something, I'll tend not to talk about it. So, so I'm sorry, that's a bad, so I shouldn't say I talk about the most important thing of the day. I talk about the thing I think that my readers should know about during the day. And I obviously assume that they watch CNBC or Bloomberg or something. So I'm going to talk about if everybody's talking about Apple, something that happened or something else happened, I'm not going to talk about it unless there's nothing else to talk about. But I like to try to point out things that maybe other people aren't paying attention to. But in this case today, I'm talking about, it's, it's still tariffs. Tariffs has been dominating most of the year. But it's still about what's going on in tariffs. And then, but, but I want to set the stage and say, look, this is what's happening. He, he, that's Baldwin, <laughs> Trump is insulting President Z. And, 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 and not insulting like President Z is too short, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, he, he's insulting him by treating him 
as if he's insignificant. By, but he's insulting him by saying, just, just saying, if you don't meet with me, I'm going to uh, ratchet up the tariffs. Okay, that indicates obviously that the Z for some reason did not agree to meet with Trump at the G20 meeting or Trump's taking credit for them. It's, it's, it's so hard because you have to like, treat the, you don't know what the president's saying if he's lying or not. That's crazy. It really is crazy. Like, you, they, you know, Trump's motives in saying something could be completely opposite of what you think because he could be completely making it up. But let's say that probably, probably, Z did not agree to meet with Trump. Trump feels desperately that he needs to show that he's doing something on the China thing. So he's now threatening Z publicly. If you don't meet with me, I will increase tariffs. All right? So on the surface, you might say, oh, that's, that's not so bad. Or that's just Trump being Trump. But what's the repercussion for Z? And well, the repercussion for Z is this. This, this jackass stands up to him, and this million people say, well, he can be stood up to. We're not scared of you. Donald Trump's not scared of you. There are no repercussions to Donald Trump for treating you like, a, like, a, like, his, like his servant by saying, you will meet with me or I will yank your chain, and I will cause you harm. So now Z is in a position where he probably has to say to Trump, screw off, I'm not meeting with you at the G20. If you want to have a meeting, you will do this. Z is almost going to be forced to turn this around on Trump and assert his authority in a very public way, which is a very non-Chinese thing to do. They would never behave so impolitely towards somebody, even if they don't like them. You would show some respect to another world leader. Trump has shown complete disrespect to Z. And, and, and it's not directly this cause, but it causes, instead of 100,000, 200,000 protesters, there's a freaking million people on the streets. Because Z looks weak. Dictators cannot afford to look weak. And, and there's infighting in this party, and there and and, and Z is Z is a moderate. Everybody else in that party would like to slit this guy's throat, and they will punish us, and they will cut off the rare earths, and they will do all sorts of horrible things to us if he doesn't get himself under control. But anyway, so I'm not talking. I'm not saying we should be scared of China like that, but I'm just saying the bottom line is they're going to retaliate. You're treating them like they're nothing, and they're not nothing. That's a very, very stupid way to conduct your business. And there's no reason for it. There's no reason at all for him to publicly demand a meeting. Now, of course, I have a theory he doesn't want to do a meeting. My theory is that Trump wants the money for the tariffs, which is essentially a tax on poor people in America. And I didn't see it as the same tax on rich people, but realistically, poor people mostly buy this stuff. Okay, rich people are not affected very much by a China tax on goods coming in from China. They'd be affected by a tax on goods coming in from Europe or goods coming in from Japan. China, not so much. Okay, they're not buying a lot of stuff there. They'd be very upset if you did this with a BMW. 25 cent tax on BMW, action will be taken right away. Okay, this is not the problem. Learjet's 25% action will be taken right away. Okay, even the Mexico thing, because it started to affect things that, that you know, people care about, like, like avocados and things like that. They're all like, no, 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 I'm not paying $5 for an avocado. This has got to stop. Um, and then, of course, the farmer base was freaking out about the Mexico thing. So he had to back off on that. And then whatever his pretend excuse was. But, but again, man, since the agreement was made, uh, months ago from with Mexico, and there's no change in what they agreed to months ago. You have to wonder what the frick he was saying anyway. Did he ever intend to do anything, or was it just a big show? So it's very hard to tell what the motives of Trump are, and that makes it tough to trade on. But the bottom line is, is, is what I mean. So, so this morning, I'm saying that the stage and saying, look, this is what's going on. You've got to be, you got to understand this. Um, then we skipped on to the uh, what we talked about. Um, 
talked about playing the Dow for the balance. That didn't work out this morning. It did well, worked out, and then it stopped real fast. The Dow, we took uh, 26. It went up to 26. Almost, almost got 100 points out of it. So there was a bit of gain from, from where we were right in the post until the open. But after that, it's been all downhill. And we're still at 26. But, you know, that, that was not a play that worked out. The, and the Russell went up five points since we were looking at it also. Uh, now he's going to calm down. I can't believe 60 is not going to be bouncing on Brent. I, I just think, <clears throat> I think once again, it's time to make a play. One, you know, 167, 168 here and the 51 line here. I mean, it's worth a shot. If you, but you've got to get right out if it's not holding. you got to, you know, we say tight stops. We mean tight stops here because it's crazy. We have the API. We talked about that setting up for today and how we wanted to trade it. And I talked about Russia and so on and so forth. Um, and all these countries, this is also, if they start going, and that's something else you've got to be aware of, they start going a long time with oil, it's, and it's Brent, you've got to watch Brent. Oh, that's not Brent. That's Brent. Okay. Oil down here is an emergency for OPEC. Anything below this line, below the $60 line, they consider an emergency. This is when they, they talked about ratcheting, you know, this is where they renewed all falling apart here and they had their meeting here which stopped it from falling but then it went down so they didn't do anything they didn't um increase they didn't decrease their production they only maintained their current production decrease this meeting now coming up they have got to decrease their uh, production if they don't decrease production more if russia doesn't join them this is going to be pointless and frankly <clears throat> you know american producers Honestly, if they want to keep the price up, the American producers have to join OPEC, which, <laughs> which would be crazy. But I mean, without you know, without America in it, if we're making uh, 10, 11 million barrels a day here, probably up to 12 million soon, and we end up making 14 million barrels a day next year, and you know, I'll tell you, at that rate though, we're going to run out of oil in this country, and we're going to suck it all dry in five years, but. Even so, for those five years, OPEC is going to be in massive trouble. The price of oil is going to collapse. They keep coming back. We keep making more. But God help us when we run out, man, because it's going to stop. All of a sudden, it's going to stop. And, and we're not going to be able to produce as much oil. Our production is going to start going down and down and down. And you're going to see oil go up so hard and so fast. But not now, not today. So don't worry about it for now. But it's gonna be that's gonna be a fun trade down the road, you know. But on the other hand, if it takes five years, we may be so many electric cars that we don't need it anymore. But that's the race. Although you know, again, now we're not the government is not encouraging these electric cars like they were. So we we kind of you know we're stalling on that. So we'll see what happens there. Todd is asking, DXD hedging the OOP keep or kill? We're going to adjust that also probably uh, tomorrow. So we will see. I mean, obviously today it looks good, right? Kill OIH in the OOP. No, no, we're going to just roll OIH along. Now, the thing about OIH, and they, I'm sure they're doing incredibly terrible at the moment, uh, OIH. The thing about OIH is eventually, eventually, they're going to have to drill wells. I mean, you can't keep producing more oil in the United States. The oil production is causing the blood. The OIH companies are the ones that supply the equipment to drill the oil. You can't keep drilling oil and not replace equipment. It doesn't work that way. So eventually, someone's got to start ordering equipment and, and, and drilling new wells and so on and so forth. Um, at the moment, they're sort of coasting on what they have and not and not spending a lot on exploration and production. So that has to change because you can't just keep a, a well. A, a well's life is about three years once you start drilling. So after three years, you deplete the well and you have to move on. So we're in a cycle where uh, we're in a trough cycle where everybody bought equipment, drilled wells, increased production, and now they're just milking what they got. But eventually the wells start to shallow out and the oil companies have to say, well, we want to keep making this money. So we're going to have to spend money now to uh, get more in the future. 
But right now, OIS is just knee-jerk reacting. So what we're going to do is obviously tweak that position. Um, we're going to just set it up to do better in the future. So hopefully this will be the bottom bottom, but we'll see. All right. Any other questions? No. Good. All right. What did we? Oh, we were going over something. What happened here? How about that? Um, so we talked about Exxon. We talked about a, a nice uh, um, doing the Chevron puts, which which obviously today is doing nicely already. So I said I like those puts. Here, the August one ten puts were a dollar twenty this morning. Let's see what they are now. I want to show you what I mean about the difference in the hedges. CVX. So here's the 110 puts. They're already a dollar. Now, see, you think it's, it doesn't sound good. It's 25 cents. That's 20% a freaking day on those puts. That's pretty good. And, um, and then we have the 120, 115 spread. All right, where's my thing? Um, 120, 115 was 165, and now the 120s are fourth. What? No shit. So now it's two bucks. So it went up from 165 to two bucks, so also 20%. So the spread made 20%, and the puts made 20%. So both of those trades made 20% today. So if we get 20% a month, 20% today. But that's your day trading. Like, wow, they're still talking Trump and the uh, and the Poland guy. Interesting. Oh, the big pissed off is. Oh, excuse me. All right, what else? Oh, back to the thing. All right, so that was it. So, so, look, it's, so again, all we did is take advantage of what was pretty obvious. I said Chevron's way too high. This is a good time. They actually was right there. I said, this is a good time to play it short, and this is an easy way to play it short. We're gonna, and it'll do, I think it's going to drop a lot more than this. If it stays here for another couple of days, you'll be down at 115, and then this put is going to be, um, <clears throat> what put was it? It was the, um, the 110 puts. Although they're 110 puts, they're, they'll still probably double up from here. You know, even though it's not 110, you're still going to get that money. But on the other hand, this spread, if you go to 115, this spread goes in the money, and it's a five dollar spread. You can make 200 percent on that. And and that's another point, by the way. When we make these trades, the idea is not to put 10 percent of your portfolio into this trade. Because if you put one percent of your portfolio in a trade like this. And it makes 200%. That's 2% on one trade. So risking just 1% of your portfolio will give you 2% on a risky trade. Those, that's how much you put. If you lose it, not a big deal. If you make it, you're adding 2% to your entire year's gains in your portfolio. So in other words, if we have a, a portfolio that is 80% made up of sensible trades that make steady money and are going to make about 20 to 30% each, right? So you're good for 20% on your steady money. And if that's going well, you take a little bit of the money you have along the sidelines and you can gamble with it once in a while where you're risking, you're not risking the whole 1%, you're risking half a percent. You're risking, you know, if it goes down, you're going to stop out. You're not going to just take a, a full loss. So you're going to risk a half a percent on a, in a, on a month on these trades. And sometimes you'll win and sometimes you'll lose. But when you win, if you lose, you lose a half a percent. But if you win, you win 2%. So the odds are 4 to 1 in your favor. And therefore, if you are 50-50 with those bets, you'll end up very much ahead. That's how you play your risk part of your portfolio. If you happen to be very wild, see, again, it's a dream. You dream you're going to be wildly successful in your risk, right, in these day trades. So fine, if you're so good at day trades and you actually are successful 10 times with a bet that makes 2% of your portfolio, you're going to add 20% to your year. You know how much money you make if you make 40% a year? I'm going to show you because I want to show you how ridiculous it is. If you make 40% a year without even adding any money for 30 years, on fifty thousand dollars, you'll have one billion dollars. Are you really that good? 
No, nobody's that good. So no matter how good you think you are at day trading and no matter how appealing it seems to day trade, you're just not that good. You cannot consistently do that. It's not possible. Nobody does it. There's Warren Buffett is not a trader. Warren Buffett's an investor. There are no traders really on the Forbes list. Very, very few. T-Bone Pickens, I guess you could say, is a trader, but he's not really. He also owns a lot of companies. He likes to act like he's a trader, but mostly he buys oil companies and he makes deals with the oil companies and he uses his reputation to set, to, to, to make things happen. You know, Carl Icahn, too, he's a trader, but not really a traditional trader because he's he buys and sells companies. He uses his reputation as a trader and strategist in order to bully people on pricing and so on and so forth. But, you know, but, but a large amount of his money came from, like, corporate trading and things like that. It wasn't trading. It was money, money management and strategies. Different. There are many guys who say who traded and made a billion dollars. So if your strategy involves trading and getting a billion dollars, and, and you, you may not think it does, but do the math. If you consistently were able to do this, you'd have a billion dollars. And since and then everybody, if you were consistently able to do it, then lots of people, wouldn't there be lots of people with a billion dollars from trading? Doesn't happen. So stop wishing it would. You know, I, I am, I'm a really, really good trader, and I aspire to consistently make what Warren Buffett makes in my hedge fund. I want to make 15, 16% a year for 20 years. That's all I want to do. Okay, because, you know, in the, in the hedge fund, they start off with uh, $500,000, and in 20 years, if you make 16% a year, you got nine million bucks, ten million bucks. That's what it's a fair retirement. I think that's that's reasonable. Somebody giving you a half million dollars, you give them ten million dollars back. That's fair. But it's long term. And like I said, this year we're up 45%. In which case you'd have a billion dollars. So therefore, I think this year, I, so rather than thinking this year is going to happen all the time. I, I take the big trades that we made money on, like Apple or CMG, we made a ton of money on CMG, and we take it off the table and go back to the 20% trades that are going to consistently make us some money. Okay, instead of thinking that you're going to keep making all this money, we go back and we take those excess profits and we put them away and we stick with the 20% trades. And when one of those 20% trades blows up and does well, we take it off the table and we get another, and we find another bargain stock. We're not in it for the home runs. We're in it for the 20%. So when we make when we get a good hit, when something makes solid, solid performance, we say thank you very much and we go back to our job. You can't keep swinging for the fences in investing. You have to learn to take those quick, consistent profits off the table and to have a, just a good, solid plan to just always make the, the easy money. Always go for the low-hanging fruit, take that money, put it back to cash, get off, get, you know, wait, look for the next opportunity. And, we, and we're doing it, we've been doing these portfolios for 18 months, um, we, you know, so far we haven't had a, re we've, had, we've had a very close to cashing them out. It really bothers me because we have made too much money and I'm really close to cashing them out because I, I just didn't like how much money we lost in the last round. The thing is when they get this big, it was easy to hedge them early on, but when they get this big, they get annoying to, to hedge because you have to, because then I'm going to, then I'm going to risk 50,000, a hundred thousand dollars just on a hedge. And now I feel like I'm gambling. Even though in a $2 million portfolio, $100,000 is 5%. Of course, I'm going to put 5% on a hedge. But it just, it just bothers me to do that. And I would feel a lot better taking all the money, putting it back into small, sensible things that make 20%, and starting again. 
It's the easiest way to go. It's the easiest way to manage it and the easiest way to make sure I'm gonna consistently make my money. We had two fabulous years in this portfolio in a row. We have 100% gains in our portfolios or more. Okay, so we're not 20%, not 40%, we're up each year 50% or more. That's way ahead of what we want it to be. We are now, if I shut it down and go to cash, we've made enough money as much as we would have made in, in four years. And we've got that now. Therefore, we can then start new portfolios, go from 20%, and even if they get wiped out, we still have enough money on the side to keep going and be on track. That's freedom. It also means I can be a little more aggressive with my second round. I mean, I, I we could... Hmm. We could and we will in like the hedge fund because in the hedge fund, we're really consistently running the same money forward. Okay, so we're doing it. But you know, in other words, what, what I'm saying is if you already made 40% and you put it aside, the next round, in, I can go, instead of going for 20%, I can get a little more aggressive because we already made our 40% in the background. I've already got that cash. So it's gonna, we can afford to take a hit. Therefore, we can afford to take a little bit more risk. A little bit, not much. Um, so there's there's a, a lot of freedom towards doing you know, to doing that. Plus, also it's like there's, there's so many positions now. You know, usually things don't work out and we get rid of them. There's there's so many positions that are working out that it makes it hard to manage. That so many positions review take me forever. It takes me two days to review the long term portfolio now. Just that, two days, two full days of my time. That's crazy. It's every month. Um, so basically, it takes me uh, an entire week every month just to review the portfolios. That's a lot of time. Um, so that's another reason I'm, I'm not too thrilled with it. And again, it's what I'm saying. It's not worth it. Sometimes you just want to simplify things and make it in the, and realize that your time has value too. <laughs> All right. So that's where we are. I think I'm going to, oh, I have to wind it down. It's 3 o'clock already. Holy cow. All right, good. So we'll we'll cut that off here, and um, we'll take another look at oil before we quit and see how that's looking. Oh, look at that! Wow. So yeah, the 51 line on oil, the um, the, the 168 on gasoline is like a you know it's crazy. So I mean I, I don't look this whole push down. It just there's no we don't see a good reason for it. The dollar spiky high. 97 usually gets rejected. All good reasons to be long here. 51 on oil and 168 on gas. And, and if 168.5 goes up, then you can play that. But th these are incredibly large drops that shouldn't have happened probably today. All right. And watch, that, watch the 60 line on Brent. Because that's if the 60 line on Brent is holding, you can stay long on these. If the 60 line fails on Brent, then probably you don't want to stay long on these guys. On oil and gasoline. But, but I, I just think it's an overreaction coupled with the strength of the dollar have all made for a bad combination for these for oil and uh, gasoline today. And unfortunately, gold and silver have not come down yet, so I'd like to see that also. Meanwhile, the index is Trump is still speaking to the Polish guy. Uh, that's not like the beginning of a joke. Trump is speaking to a Polish guy, and uh, <laughs> we don't have those jokes anymore, right? What about Apple? Whoa. You know, he's good. An Italian, a Jew, and an Arab walked into a bar, blah, blah, blah. You're not allowed to, apparently, you're not allowed to make those kind of jokes anymore. Crazy. Right? Because <laughs> they're all based on stereotypes that are considered uh, politically incorrect. It's just funny. It's like a whole brand of humor is dead. Anyway, with that thought, have a lovely, lovely week. Oh, we're not going to do a webinar next week. It's going to be in New York City. Oh, sorry. Yes, next week, see, next week if somebody wants to come see us, we're going to be in New York City at uh, a cannabis, not a cannabis, a CBD show. I got to get my drug straight. We're at a CBD show because Hemp Boca, PSW Investments, in addition to owning uh, part of New Age, which is a California manufacturer of marijuana, or they, or they, 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 make, they manufacture the oil of marijuana that goes into um, various products, mostly edibles. Um, so, you know, we're not selling the pot. We're, we're, we're not growing the pot. We're just manufacturing from the pot. We also do have a retail component. Um, the, this is Hemp Boca, which is a pure CBD company. And uh, Hemp Boca 
is doing all sorts of cool stuff as far as like you know make getting getting into meetings and things like that so far no actual you know no no big contracts have been signed yet but but things are looking good and we're getting a lot of interest um and if you happen to know anyone who wants cbd products or wants to do something in the cbd industry let us know because we're very excited to make deals right now but anyway so with hemp boker we're going to uh be with kevin harrington who used to be a shark tank guy uh also a billionaire he's um his group is having a cbd uh showcase i guess you would call it with various cbd companies uh and the press and all sorts of stuff and then the consumers are going to come so it's going to be in in um new york city 515 greenwich street next friday saturday and sunday so you guys can find me there some of that time i'm not going to sit there i'm not going to be i'm going to be there for three straight days i got meetings and stuff but at points during the days i'll be in and out and if you guys are if anybody's in the city i'd be very happy to try to meet up all right so have a, have a great week and uh next week i'll tell you what's going on i'll let you know and chat what's going on and we'll um do this again the week after that all right take care everybody